Last time we talked about the retreat doctrine. An actor is sometimes privileged to use deadly force, even though the use of deadly force is unnecessary. This time our topic is the aggressor doctrine. According to this doctrine, also called provocation doctrine, an actor is sometimes not privileged to use deadly force, even though it is necessary to defend yourself. Recall how self-defense, as an affirmative defense, operates. The defendant wants to widen the context for the fact finder to include facts about the victim's conduct as perceived by the defendant. But the prosecution can also widen the context by showing that the defendant created the need to use force. Where that happens, the defendant can be deprived of what otherwise might be a viable defense. This is the so-called aggressor doctrine, and we see it in play in the case of U.S. versus Peterson. Peterson saw Kite stealing windshield wipers from Peterson's wrecked car parked in the back of Peterson's house. Peterson went outside and objected. After a verbal exchange with Kite, Peterson went back inside and then returned with a gun. Kite by then was seated in his own car and was about to depart. If you move, Peterson shouted to Kite, I will shoot. Kite got out of his car and advanced on Peterson with a lug wrench in his hand. When Kite failed to maintain social distance, Peterson shot him dead. Peterson appeals from his manslaughter conviction. One error alleged was an instruction to the jury to consider whether Peterson was the aggressor in the altercation that immediately preceded the homicide. On the appeal, Peterson's counsel argued that there was no evidence that Peterson caused or contributed to the conflict and that instructions on the aggressor doctrine could only have misled the jury. Peterson's conviction is affirmed. In the court's opinion, the right of homicidal self-defense is denied to slayers who incite the fatal attack, encourage the fatal quarrel, or otherwise promote the necessitous occasion for taking life. Those who were found to have incited, encouraged, or promoted an affray are not privileged to defend themselves with deadly force. The result seems harsh. Didn't Kite start it? Wasn't Kite the provoker? The court writes. The fact that the deceased struck the first blow, fired the first shot, or made the first menacing gesture does not legalize the self-defense claim if, in fact, the claimant was the actual provoker. But how is the fact finder to decide whether Peterson was the actual provoker rather than Kite? The court suggests an analogy to the Laney case. In Laney, the defendant was chased by an angry mob. Laney escaped, but chose to return to a place where, in the court's words, he had every reason to believe that his presence would provoke trouble. Laney exchanged fire with his assailants and one was killed. Laney's conviction was upheld and so too is Peterson's. Aggressor doctrine can be contrasted to complicity doctrine. Going someplace with knowledge of the likelihood of violent consequences is enough under Laney to deprive the defendant of the privilege of using deadly force in self-defense. So also in the Andrews case on page 928. It matters not that the defendant's presence was not illegal, nor does it matter under Andrews that the defendant's purpose was innocent. But mere presence with intent to help or encourage is not enough under Hicks to amount to aiding or abetting. Aggressor doctrine can also be contrasted to the doctrine of voluntary manslaughter. Under the appellate court reasoning in Laney and Peterson, no reason appears why a provocation cannot consist 
in verbal conduct that the defendant uses with the knowledge that an affray will result. But under the traditional doctrine expounded in Girard, words alone do not count as legally adequate provocation and so will not mitigate murder to manslaughter. The model penal code formulation of the aggressor doctrine is slightly but crucially different. It states, deadly force is not justifiable if the actor, with the purpose of causing death or serious bodily harm, provoked the use of deadly force against himself in the same encounter. The defendant who uses deadly force cannot raise the defense of self-defense if he is a provoker. But notice that the fact finder must be persuaded that it was the defendant's purpose to use deadly force and manufactured a pretext by provoking the victim. What outcome on the facts of Laney under a model penal code instruction? Laney was counted as the actual provoker because he had every reason to know his return to the street would cause trouble. The model penal code speaks of purpose rather than mere knowledge and strips the defendant of his right to raise self-defense only if it is his purpose to create a pretext for using deadly force. Mere knowledge suffices under Laney and the Andrews case. There is another respect in which the model penal code widens the availability of the defense of self-defense. We all know from experience, including television and movies, that often disputes start small, flare up, and escalate, sometimes leading to a fatal outcome. Sometimes a provoker gets more than she bargained for, as when the provoked person suddenly poses a deadly threat. Traditionally, the only way a provoker can recover the privilege of using deadly self-defensive force is by withdrawing. But what if the provoker cannot withdraw? The model penal code notes this kind of situation. A attacks B with his fists. B defends himself and subdues A, pinning him to the floor. B then starts to batter A's head savagely against the floor. A manages to rise, and since B is still attacking him, and A now fears that if he is thrown again to the floor, he will be killed, A uses a knife. B is killed or seriously wounded. A's initial non-deadly attack makes A the provoker. The only way A can recover the right to defend himself is by withdrawing. But withdrawal is not an option here. A is under deadly attack by B. Under traditional doctrine, A is not entitled to use deadly force to repel B's deadly threat. The model penal code intends a different result. A is, of course, criminally liable for his initial battery on B, but would have a justifying defense for the ultimate homicide unless A entered the encounter with the purpose of causing death or serious bodily harm. He was justified in resisting A's unlawful non-deadly force with non-deadly force. B went beyond that and is using deadly force. B's escalation of the level of violence restores A's right to defend with deadly force, but A remains unjustified in the initial battery. Fact patterns can become complicated. It helps to work through them carefully. In the meantime, Take the Laney opinion's advice and avoid places where you have every reason to believe your presence will provoke trouble.